to a couple of things here. I just want to remind everybody, they're putting it up on the screen, but uh, over in this corner area that's walled in, you enter from the other side. If you get a chance, go in, check out the video loop. I think you'll find it very interesting uh, as you uh, make your travels around the conference. Um, it is with great honor, um, I'm going to introduce our Oklahoma State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Commissioner, uh, Terry White. Uh, Terry um, is uh, an unbelievable, we are so lucky here in Oklahoma. Many of you are from uh, other states that are here and uh, uh, those of us who are from Oklahoma, we know and love Terry. Uh, she is one of us, she is an advocate. Uh, and we are incredibly fortunate to have her as our commissioner here in the state of Oklahoma. If you're from another state, you can't have her. Um, under Terry's leadership, she's worked with us. All, all the housing that you've heard us talk about here in Tulsa that we've done, um, uh, uh, under Terry's leadership of the department, a great partner, great supporter, uh, believes and understands what we're trying to do to uh, help people live in recovery uh, in the community. Um, it's completely and totally supports the development uh, of peer outreach services uh, and supports funding directed in those areas. Um, helps us, uh, they've helped us fund our peer run drop-in center uh, and very, very involved in youth suicide prevention. Those are just to name of a few of the things that under Terry's leadership uh, that we've been able to uh, develop in Oklahoma and we continue to develop. Um, just as a little aside, uh, the, the putting on of this Zero Symposium every year, uh, we've done it 18 years, you've heard us mention that, 10 of the years her Human Resource Department has partnered with us and you don't necessarily see them in the conference, but believe me, you're, they are there uh, and they are absolutely wonderful and essential to putting on this conference every year. Um, you know, just a little bit about Terry. I won't go into a lot. I want to give her time to uh, uh, share uh, from her heart, her mind, things that, that she's got some exciting things to talk about. But um, she has been our uh, commissioner since uh, 2007. Uh, I asked her a while ago, are you still the youngest state commissioner of the country? She said, I don't know if I am still, but I was. And I have a feeling she still may be. Um, she served as the treasurer in the, of the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. Some of you know that as NASHBID. Uh, and she's been very active with National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Directors. And uh, Terry, uh, we're lucky to have you. I'm lucky, to, uh, I feel very fortunate that to call you uh, my friend and um, that you're such a friend of advocates. And, and let me tell you, the last thing I'll say about Terry is that um, she is a wonderful mother to her son, uh, three, three-year-old son, Asher. And she talks about Asher, and we've been talking about it here. So Terry, come up and share with us. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming her. Good afternoon. Welcome to Tulsa and to Oklahoma for those of you that are out of state and even out of the country. I hear we have four countries represented here today, which I think is fantastic. You're going to learn lots of things you can do back in your country to make a difference. I love the fact that Mike still talks about how I may be the youngest commissioner in the nation. I'm scared to death when he stops asking that question because I will know now that I look as old as I really am. But we're going to keep asking that. I keep saying it so you'll keep asking. I just have a few minutes to talk to you about some amazing things that are happening here in Tulsa, but before I do that, I want to talk about one of the things that many of us, in fact, probably every single one of us in this room knows, but we have to say this out loud and remind ourselves because we have to tell other people. Behavioral health, having good mental health, having good brain health, and being addiction-free is the key ingredient. It is the key ingredient to making sure we have healthy families, healthy communities, healthy nations, and it is often overlooked. Whether that's because of discrimination, whether it's because of misunderstanding, whether it's because many of us historically were involved in systems that acted like the brain was a different part of the body. There was the entire healthcare system and then the mental health system over here. 
And we haven't done ourselves any favors by creating that. And as a result, I don't think everyone truly understands that if we look at all of the things we want to change in our city, in our state, in our nation, and in our countries, it all begins with having good brain health at the root of many of these problems. And one of the things we know is when we don't address we don't address good brain health, when we don't have healthy minds, we see consequences like people showing up in the emergency room with uncompensated care. We know that when we see other things happening, businesses suffer. We know that the number two reason for lost absenteeism has to do with untreated mental illness and addiction. Number two reason for absenteeism. You can't perform well at work if you're not there, right? And so we know this desperately affects businesses, and yet businesses, although Tulsa businesses are very involved, and you'll see many of our business leaders around, not all businesses truly understand how important brain health is to their bottom line. We know that it impacts our communities, it impacts our schools. Children who have behavioral health issues, 30% of them don't complete high school. We talk about wanting to see an amazing economy. We've got to get people high school diplomas and then college diplomas. And a key to that is having good brain health and getting early services to our children. And we'll know we've achieved this. We'll know we've achieved this when we see that every Oklahoman, every Tulsa, every United States citizen, every citizen in the world who has untreated mental illness and addiction gets the help they need so that they no longer see the inside of a police car, the inside of a jail cell, or the inside of a prison cell instead of the inside of a medical facility, which is where they belong. We also know, and Tulsa is a great example of this, we also know that we will have achieved this when every person who has struggled with mental health or substance abuse issues has safe and affordable housing and has a job just like everybody else. And there's some amazing models of collaboration happening right here that I think we can all learn from and one we can celebrate. And one of the first things I want to do is I want to thank some amazing folks who created something called Building Tulsa, Building Lives. Judy Kitchener and Gail Richards, part of the Zero Family Foundation. In support of the amazing work of Mike Bros and the Mental Health Association of Tulsa, I have no doubt that Tulsa is going to be the first community in the United States to eliminate homelessness for persons with mental illness as a result of the work that they're doing. And together they partner with other organizations that provide the necessary treatment. We have great, great providers in Tulsa. And I know if I go through the list of every provider, I'm going to leave somebody off, and so I'm not going to do it. But you all know we have amazing partners and amazing providers in Tulsa. And we do some really unique things here in this community. It's, actually, I'm not a Tulsan, although they've agreed to adopt me, <laughs> because um, I live in Oklahoma City, and located, as you might imagine, near the capital where my office is. And the things that are happening in Tulsa around mental illness treatment and the collaboration that's happening make it a very, very unique city. It's one of my favorite places to come spend time and talk because truly, part of my job is to inspire people. And when I come here, I get to get inspired. I get to get inspired because I get to see how people come together. And so I am here up here at the podium today to also make an incredibly exciting announcement for the city of Tulsa. We fought very hard at the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services last year for a desperately needed crisis beds desperately needed crisis beds. We know right now we have law enforcement officers on the street at this moment driving someone potentially hundreds of miles to find a treatment bed in this state because all of our beds are full. Our law enforcement partners who are amazing are having to take hours. And worse than that, the person who needs services is sitting in the back of a police car instead of getting the help that they need. And so we fought desperately for the funding for five new crisis centers. We were visit, we, when most agencies weren't getting any new money, and through the leadership of Governor Fallon and her budget proposal, we were successful in getting funding for one crisis center. Um, because we are a very innovative agency and I have amazing staff, we did some very unique things and we are going to be able to stretch those dollars far enough with a little bit of additional money from the legislature to actually put two crisis centers in place this year. And the announcement that I want to make today is that Family and Children's Services here in Tulsa is going to be the recipient of one of the crisis centers so that there will be 16 new crisis beds coming to Tulsa now. And so let me tell you a little bit about this. This move is going to strengthen the behavioral health care system statewide, but providing desperately needed beds here. The addition of these services is made possible by the funds, the funding that comes from us, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, that was put in place by Governor Fallon as well as the legislature. 
They're designed to create an additional crisis center, and it, we went through an open bid system, and we originally requested, as I mentioned, the funding for five. We received one. We're going to be able to do two. The second center, just so you'll know, is going to be located in Ardmore. A key component, and the reason Tulsa is so successful, and this is what I mean by community collaboration, is that the contracts that were awarded here, the contract for family and children's services, they chose to partner, not just do it on their own. It's an amazing partnership. In fact, we were talking earlier, we think it may be the first partnership we can find between the state, a private nonprofit, and a private for-profit. And specifically, let me tell you what they're going to do. Family and Children's Services partnered with the state-operated Tulsa Center for Behavioral Health Program to create a behavioral health urgent care model. They also are going to partner with Hillcrest Medical Center, which will provide the 16 new psychiatric crisis beds. And there's a plan and a coordinated effort for emergency services at Hillcrest Medical Center to help identify and divert appropriate cases to a more appropriate level of care when accessing the emergency medical system. This overall in Tulsa fully integrates the existing community behavioral health treatment system so that folks who are in crisis will be followed afterwards and be able to integrate right into community services, hopefully making them the least likely to come right back in the front door for emergency services again. Through the leadership of Gail Lapidus and Family and Children's Services, there's also going to be whole health care provided because we know that often people with untreated mental illness and addiction are some of the most physically ill individuals as well. We know that they need a host of medical services and this is a chance at whole health through the partnership then that's available for housing and for employment. We are going to see so many, so many of our Tulsans and other members of our surrounding communities achieve true recovery as a result of this award. It's going to be amazing and it's going to begin hopefully in early 2013. And the best part of it, for the, and use this, use these words to convince anybody who doesn't believe yet. The best part of it is it's going to save taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars because people will now be getting better as opposed to having to come through expensive systems that cost us more and don't do any good. It's going to save us taxpayer dollars. So for those of you that are visiting Oklahoma, those are some of the amazing things that are happening here. We hope that you, anything that we can share with you to take back to your community, we would love the chance to do it. While we don't, we, have, we still have huge gaps in our system. On any given day, two-thirds of Oklahomans who need treatment for their mental illness and addiction can't get it. We have waiting lists across the state of 600 to 900 Oklahomans who desperately need substance abuse treatment and every bed is full. But what I can tell you is with the dollars we have, with all of our partners, we do amazing things. Amazing things that took us from a 2006 grade of a D on the NAMI report card to the only state to jump two letter grades to get a B in 2009. Because with the resources we have, recovery happens every single day in our state and we'd love to share that with you. We're very proud of what we've accomplished. And we'd also like to steal any good ideas you have and improve on them and make them even better here so that we can be the first state to get an A because so far nobody's done that. So what I'd like to ask all of us to do, because what we do is really rewarding but can be very challenging some days, is let's take this as an opportunity to rededicate ourselves, to really recommit to championing the issues that we see before us, to know that behavioral health is essential to overall health and we're the ones that are going to deliver that message, to know that prevention works and that treatment works and that we know people can and do recover every day and we're going to do everything we can to continue to support that. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for having me. I think we just heard from Pam Hyde's successor as the administrator of SAMHSA. Thank you, Terry. That was wonderful. Um, I know a lot of states that would love to clone you. Um, we're next going to um, have our keynote. And uh, to introduce our participants, um, we have a great mental health advocate, uh, Pender McElroy has served on the Mental Health America's board for a number of years, and he is a recipient of the 2004 Sandy Brand Award from Mental Health America as the Volunteer of the Year. He is currently board chair, and I deserve, or he deserves a great deal of gratitude from me since he chaired the board at the time of my selection. So um, Pender will always carry a, a special place in my heart. Um, but in just two days, he'll be passing on the baton to our incoming chair, Ann Boughton. We all thank him for his outstanding leadership 
Pender, where are you? There you are. Pender McElroy. Good afternoon. Mental Health America has traditionally had our annual conference in Washington, D.C. Some years we venture out of Washington. We haven't ventured out of Washington in quite some time. Uh, so we have very much appreciated the opportunity to be a part of the Zaro Mental Health Symposium. And we are very appreciative to the Mental Health Association in Tulsa, to Mike Bros, to Julie Alexander, and, and others who uh, have been part of the sponsorship and, and making this symposium be such a successful uh, event. We thank uh, Mental Health America, thanks the Zaro family, the Zaro Foundations, and all of the partners, sponsors, and exhibitors. Uh, I must say that um, this uh, symposium is certainly on a par and maybe in some of the speakers and breakout sessions uh, a tad above some of the things that, uh, some of the very fine conferences we have put on in D.C. So I think we're going to learn something here this year uh, as we move to have our uh, conference back in the D.C. area next year. But uh, we are very appreciative uh, to the uh, folks here in Tulsa. Uh, my wife uh, spent a year at Oral Roberts University, but I've never been to Tulsa, so we're glad to She's glad to be back, and I'm glad to, to come and learn more about your fine city. Very pleased today to have uh, two uh, outstanding persons to participate uh, in, in presenting the program to you in, in an interview format. The, the subject of the interview is Dr. Mark Vonnegut. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him. He is a consumer. He's a distinguished physician specializing in pediatrics and he's a memoirist. He is the son of the late writer Kurt Vonnegut. In 1975, Dr. Vonnegut wrote the Eden Express, which described his trip to British Columbia to set up a commune with his friends and his personal experiences with schizophrenia. At that time, he attributed his schizophrenia to stress, diet, and in part, drug use. The book is widely cited as useful for those coping with schizophrenia. In 2010, he published his second book entitled, Just Like Someone Without Mental Illness, Only More So. This book was a vivid and very personal story about surviving bipolar disorder. Conducting the interview will be Rich Fisher. Uh, Mr. Fisher is the general manager of Public Radio Tulsa and host of the public affairs program on station KWGS called Studio Tulsa. This program recently celebrated its 20th anniversary, and as host of Studio Tulsa, Mr. Fisher has conducted roughly 4,000 interviews with local, national, and international figures in the arts, humanities, sciences, and government. He has been honored for his work by several organizations, including the Governor's Arts Award for Media by the State Arts Council, and he was named one of the 99 great things about Oklahoma by Oklahoma Today magazine. In addition to his work in public radio, Rich is currently the principal trombonist of the Signature Symphony at Tulsa Community College. He leads the Starlight Jazz Orchestra and is a freelance musician. So, gentlemen, if you will come forward, please. Wow, this is like a Verizon commercial. There we go. Can you hear me now? I don't know. Yeah, here we go. There we go. 
Try it. Yes? Yes. Hey. That's too loud. Too loud. Sound is a good thing. Anyway, I'm Rich, and this is uh, Dr. Mark. And uh, I, one of the things I took away from your book, you wrote that you had the bad luck to get sick four times and the remarkable good luck to get better each time, and that none of us are entirely well, and none of us are recon uh, irreconcilably sick. You said at the, at the best of times, you had islands of sick. And at the worst of times, you had islands of wellness. This seemed to be a very important point in the book. Why was it important? Well, it, it, it just, um, I mean, it was a fact that uh, of being sick, I felt like I was on a pendulum and there was just a little teeny point where I could actually talk to somebody or be part of the world. And I wanted to, to enlarge that. And I, you know, and I think, um, uh, a lot of illnesses, you're not available. I was not available. Um, um, it, you know, when I thought I was a nuclear device about to explode, uh, you know, somebody talking to me about my family and my hopes and dreams and stuff wasn't going to go very far. <laughs> um, it, it, it just, it was a frightening experience and a very, very lonely experience. And I think I have um, had very good luck to have learned things from, you know, other patients, from nurses, from doctors, from, you know, I've, I, and I've taken being available uh, and recognized it for what it was and tried to, and been very lucky. And um, um, these illnesses are not benign. <laughs> uh, and uh, I recognized very early um, that it may in part be a reasonable reaction to an unreasonable society, but if it happens more than about 10 times, uh, fully recovering becomes less and less likely. Um, and that they are sort of medical emergencies. And I found the sort of the casualness uh, that my generation had uh, and the R.D. Lang stuff, a brilliant intellectual, added a lot to the, to the but it, these are illnesses. <laughs> And they, and they are no joke, and they have you know, morbidity and mortality. And are, yeah. Well, yeah, but when we talk about stigma, mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think this is one of the most important points I took away, was the fact that you, you write many times, none of us are really completely well, none of us are completely ill yeah. or sick. Yeah. And I want to be the first one to notice, <laughs> not the last. <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, you know, in a, in a room full of, you know, wonderful caretakers, I want, you know, my, my job is to uh, be able to take care of my own business so that you wonderful people don't have to try to do it for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Well, let's, let's take a step back in time. Uh, let's go back in family history. You have a, a long history of family members and predecedents mm -hmm. that uh, were involved in the arts. And mm -hmm. in addition to being a wonderful writer, you, 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 you paint, and I think you're involved in some other arts, a, visual, a number I of visual think. arts. But this history of artists goes back at least several generations. And also there's a history of, of, of mental health problems, too. How, how far does that go back? Uh, my great-grandfather, um, according to my mother, um, uh, drank himself to death trying to keep the voices away. Uh, my grandmother was in and out of psychiatric hospitals for many, many years at a time. This was before there were any medications. And she suddenly, at Indiana State Hospital, got better. And I believe because there was an attendant there who noticed her and talked to her, and she was available, and she took that and ran. And uh, my mother was the most charming, extroverted, wonderful person in the world. And people just couldn't stand the idea of putting her in a hospital. <laughs> but she had, you know, uh, you know, for me uh, to to have a mother who can give you such horrible advice as to, and I said I'm having a terrible time with the voices, and she said, why don't you just go along with them? I do. <laughs> that is horrible. <laughs> Who's that? 
who that was. But yeah, but, but, but the fact is she had integrated this illness into her life beautifully and that I was in a family where it wasn't a completely foreign idea. And when I, in the midst of a psychosis, told my mother, she said, what can I do for you? I said, cowboy boots and a black leather jacket. And within a couple hours, that woman went out and bought <laughs> cowboy boots and a black leather jacket. And I knew that the world was a place that could listen. I, I mean, I look at the care. I got much better care than my grandmother got. Uh, the illness goes on. I'm not, I got much better care than my nieces and nephews are getting. Um, and, and I think for all the new medications and whatever, the care that somebody gets today is not as good as the care that was available to me 30 years ago. Why, years ago. why do you suppose that? Is it just the nature of our, our contemporary medicine? I, I think it, it has a lot to do with money and, um, and the fact that among other things, I was hospitalized for many months, and I was horrified to learn that my uh, family had to come up with $11,000. I don't think you can hospitalize somebody for several months. And if you could take what I had to pay uh, for medication and pay that today, or what it cost to hospitalize somebody uh, you know, for four months back then, I mean, you know, people are over-medicated. They're basically, they get through the, the check-in. The, uh, the, they can barely do their metrics on the patient safety initiatives and they're back out, out again and they don't know what the hell's going on. Um, and they're, you know, hospitalizing somebody can be life-saving. And I think we lost that somehow. And I think to some extent the community mental health movement and, and beware of things with beautiful names became a fly little bird and a lot of little birds didn't fly. Mm. You know? yeah. One of the things you talked about during your hospitalizations was the fact that, getting back to that idea of uh, uh, you have an island of wellness, an island of, of illness, that there were times you were, during a mental health break, there were times when you were, you were back, you were there, you were there, and, and there was somebody there to talk to exactly. at that particular right. moment, and right. that was critical to, well, explain. Explain why that was critical. I remember in great detail, um, you know, a heroin addict who jumped on the back of an orderly who was coming in to give me an injection. And that was, you know, and I noticed he was trying to help me. And I, and I, I was sort of, there was an alcoholic who was sick of listening to my ranting and raving, and he took me into his room, and I, I think I was just keeping him up or something, but he could tell me that he had listened to everything I said about the train and the black Jesus and the white Jesus and this stuff, and, and he just said, you're not in charge anymore, give it up. And, you know, I was there for that. I was there for, um, you know, when doctors said that, you had, that I had an illness. I, I do want to say that the diagnosis game is, you know, I was diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic prior to the, the new DSM when you all of a sudden, and then I was, uh, when I had been well for a while, I lost the diagnosis of schizophrenia because you had to have symptoms continuously for five years. And if you use that to diagnose tuberculosis, it really messes things up. But anyway, <laughs> um, so then I, I uh, when I, Part of the admissions committee at Harvard was a differential diagnosis, and, and they literally told me, um, if you had schizophrenia, we're not, we wouldn't admit you to Harvard Medical School. I said, okay. We're admitting you to Harvard Medical School, therefore, you do not have schizophrenia. <laughs> so I, 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 so I, got, I got promoted, and, but I do, I, I, I have friends who are exactly like me, um, who, because, uh, and it's a game of, of, of real inches, who are incoherent on the street. So I, go, I went looking for him in Santa Monica, um, and he is crippled by tardive dyskinesia. This guy was, there's no difference between him and me. He even had a more illustrious family. I won't tell you who, you know, what Supreme Court justice was his, whatever. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're rookies. But anyway, um, it, 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 there is no difference. I have... Um, uh, I have a, another guy who is classic bipolar, had his own company, several, several um, you know, patents and how you ultrasound hearts and how you digitalize information and stuff like that. 
but he has been sick so much so often that he is now the only thing is these massive antipsychotics. So where exactly is the difference between these illnesses and does it really make a difference? Um, you know, I, I can say my father met diagnostic criteria for PTSD. On the other hand, I can tell you PTSD does not exist. There, you know, it's a complete construction whereby you can get some group of veterans to say they don't like another group of veterans because of the disorder. I mean, what we all have is, you know, it's the same. It's, you know, and so to... to You're saying post-traumatic stress. Right. For, for very strong right. in our lives. Right. And, and my sisters and I would sit around saying, well, he's not bipolar, he's not schizophrenic. He ain't well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for most of us, let's talk a little bit about, just, just a little bit about your father, because uh, I think probably for most of us, we think that you had a famous father growing up, and that is not the case. He did not have success till you were out of the house, pretty much. I know, and that's a blessing. You know. Why was it a blessing? <laughs> because money's an illness. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, no, I really, I, I think that to have uh, grown up the son of a struggling car salesman. You said he was the worst car salesman in the world. He was terrible. <laughs> it, it, he, he tried to teach people about front wheel drive and sobs by doing the test drive himself. And people were green and nauseous because he was telling them how they could accelerate through the corners. And I, as a 12-year-old as a kid, was telling him that he should maybe let them drive and not have him do the driving. But no, this business was horrible. And he was also unable to get a job teaching English at Cape Cod Community College. And, um, you know, I finally, after many years, put it together that the fact that he got a life and survived and thrived had to do with his being an artist and, have, and him telling the truth to save his own life. And you don't have to call it PTSD. You don't have to notice that Billy Pilgrim in Slaughterhouse-Five being unstuck in time is a perfect literary description of, of what you call PTSD. You don't have to, I mean, he was just because he goddamn well had to or he wasn't going to have a life or he was going to be homeless. He had to tell the truth and he had enough of the arts in his blood to do it. That, that thought about the arts, you feel this is very important to your own mental health and to your family's right. mental health. How, right. how important was it? You know, we should mention you had a great grandfather who was an architect who built a lot of the downtown of Indianapolis had a couple generations of architects, you and mm -hmm. your father a writer, and you paint and write. Right. I always thought it was just sort of a show-off kind of thing, but it uh, turns out to be life-saving. <laughs> in, in what ways? <laughs> um, because if you can, and I still have the uh, Christmas tree ornaments I made in art therapy, if you can come together enough to try to make a belt or a Christmas tree ornament and focus and have a relationship with it, it becomes one of those islands where you're making contact with the world. And uh, so you need art therapy, you need the, you need the leather work, you need everything because you're fighting for your life. Mm. And, and to me, it is, it is all the same. And, and so the fact that I've been promoted from schizophrenia to bipolar disease, and, uh, I, and I had a brief stint as with a Harvard psychiatrist, I had a severe post-adolescent adjustment reaction, which as near as I can tell means life. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I mean, the, the diagnosis is, is, you know, it's one more rat trap to get caught in. And, um, and it's like, you know, housing first, housing second, housing third. If you don't keep somebody warm and safe, whatever else you do for them isn't going to do much, whether they're depressed or have unipolar depression or uh, bipolar, whatever it is, that person's not going to get well. You mentioned uh, your promotion. Can you talk about, at age 23, being diagnosed with schizophrenia, what, that, what you thought it meant at the time in your lucid moments and, 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 and what it turned out to me. I was blessed in that the doctors who took care of me believed in the medical model and the medical model has since been cannibalized into take your meds and shut up. But um, what it meant back then was there was no shame and there was no blame. This is a neurochemical kind of thing. And so that just became part of me. 
I was never taught to be guilty or ashamed. And I really sort of stumbled into this honesty thing. I'm not that brave. And um, uh, I, how, did, I, how did you stumble into it? I, well, I was busy and you know, I was doing other things. And so I'd be as a resident drawing my own lithium levels and sending them to the lab and they'd come <laughs> back and people would think it odd that, you know, and I would say, you know, people would say, you know, if somebody said that's too much honesty for me. I said, well, what, <laughs> you know, here's the deal. Lithium is a really toxic medicine. I wouldn't take it if I didn't need it. And why is somebody else interested in why, whether or not I'm taking a psychiatric medication? They must have real problems if they're interested in whether or not I'm taking lithium. <laughs> and the residency, I got really good. I needed it. You know, I, you know, I really needed all that affirmation of getting into medical school. And you know, I was really, really good at taking care of sick people. They said, yeah, maybe he's crazy, but you know, we need him to run the emergency room. You know, we can't, we're not getting rid of him. He, he really, really knows how to take care of sick kids. So. <laughs> the decision to become a doctor. This mm -hmm. is, it, at the time you were, your, your first break, you, you were, you know, in a commune and, mm -hmm. and this was gonna be the lifestyle. But what, what led you to, to go to medical school and how did being a consumer, an avid consumer mm -hmm. of medical care inform how you became a doctor? I think I did it to some extent for wrong reasons. It was about the power relationships. I noticed that the people with the stethoscopes got to wear ties and tell you whether or not you could wear slippers or shoes and whether you could go to the day room or not. And I, you know, I, I didn't, you know, my psychiatrist had a 59 Cadillac with the fins. I wanted that. I, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be the scrawny little powerless guy who was, you know. And, um, and the other thing about schizophrenia and back then is I was a voluntary member of the underclass because I weighed about 125 pounds. I hadn't eaten or slept in several weeks. I had, I had the long Old Testament look, the beard down to here, the long hair. So to me, I think a doctor looks at that and I look like something's not going to get well. So that's schizophrenia. If you're well dressed, you're more likely to be bipolar. And also, <laughs> it, uh, it used to be actually taught in some medical schools that black people didn't get bipolar disease. If you're black and crazy, you're schizophrenic. And um, so I look at Thelonious Monk, who is a brilliant musician, composer, Clear genius, didn't get sick until his 30s by anybody, except for the fact that guy's black, he would have been bipolar. <laughs> he would have been. <laughs> so it's always been about, you know, and they say it's always been about the, these race and class and, and, and separating people out as worthy or not worthy of treatment. Did you feel that once your father became famous and you were having a break, that that, that affected the treatment you got? Um, I think, no, it didn't really because, I mean, and by my last break, I think uh, facilities had been so degraded, I couldn't even get into McLean. I was very, very bitter that I was sent to a lower tier mental hospital. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm on the damn faculty. You can't get me into McLean, <laughs> you know? I... The last break you were talking about was what, 1985? Mm-hmm. And what, I mean, you'd been in, you'd, You'd been uh, in remission for how many years? I don't know if the Well, you see, that's the, right the thing. Um, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, things have been going well. I had drifted into a little bit of, I mean, wellness for me also involved um, um, three beers, half a bottle of wine, two shots of Jack Daniels, and five to six milligrams of Xanax. And that was a lot of stuff. So we're a lot of self-medicating. Yeah, but, you yeah. know, I was not psychotic. Uh, um, and functioning well. Very well. At you least, know? at least to I, uh, yeah, outside you know, viewpoint. Yeah, and I was really shocked. I'm one of the few alcoholics that have diagnosed themselves by using Goodman and Gilman and reading the chapter on withdrawal from alcohol. And I said, Well, well, if I've got these symptoms, guess what I have? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so that I mean, that's what happened. I realized I, I that I was. That, that I was living in a smaller and smaller shoebox with fewer and fewer feelings, although professionally I was doing quite well. So I stopped it all to prove I didn't have a problem and 
guess what? I had a seizure and a psychotic break, and so that's. Mm -hmm. And ap after after that break, things went well in your practice. I mean, can you right? Can I had, you I had, to, the, I had to chat with the impaired physician people, and we had to come up with with a reasonable diagnosis, and you know, wait for me to keep my license and all that. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we're going to open it up to questions here in just a few minutes, so be thinking of some questions. We're talking with Mark Vonnegut. Yes. And, um, you know, one thing about this book, you, you've, you've obviously, we get a sense of, of where you come from in, mm -hmm. in talking about your, rela your relationship with, with this illness, and there's a lot of humor in this. Uh, I have a very free and wonderful life. I mean, the wonderful thing about all the energy I have saved by not trying to convince people I don't have mental illness. It's just, <laughs> you know, I really, you know, it's freed up an awful lot. And, you know, um, and, you know, I tell people all the time, it's much easier to be a mentally ill physician than a carpenter because you go to work all, the, all day wrong, and if you're off base, the kids know it. And, you know, and they let you know in a hurry. And so I, you know, it's really been uh, for me. And I know, you know, what I wanted to tell this group is there are a lot of people who get lost to follow up for good reasons, because we get busy. We go off. We have to draw our own lithium levels in emergency rooms because we're busy and, and, and we don't have time to check back in to tell you that we're doing okay. Uh, and that, so mental illness is not, uh, you know, it's, it is pretty universal, and whether you meet diagnostic criteria or where you fit into uh, best treatment guidelines or whatever, it doesn't, you know, doesn't mean. And, and and the roots of it are homelessness, stress, whether whether it's stress in war, or stress somewhere else, having an untreated addict as a parent, having crushing poverty. Um, there's a whole wonderful line of research called turning gold into lead just about what are the childhood factors that produce mental illness, addiction, heart disease, it's all the same damn stuff. Um, mm. and, and if you have, there was a, another wonderful study which done recently, they studied all these wonderful Massachusetts emergency rooms where you have Tufts, BU, University of Massachusetts and the beloved Harvard, all taking care of kids in emergency rooms. They had the temerity to put a social worker to ask the people with children if in the last two weeks they had had not enough food, not enough heat, not enough uh, shelter. And 40% of the people who were waiting there for hours to see whether or not they got amoxicillin were in fact uh, desperately challenged. And 40% of those kids were there because they didn't have enough food, clothing, homes. Uh, and, 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 you know, and you don't have to be, get fancy to say that you know, treatment for addictions on demand, housing, first, second, third, and fourth. It's not fancy, people. You know, it's not fancy. Talking about that, mm -hmm. uh, when you're seeing your own patients, how does having been a consumer <laughs> inform what you do with your own patients? But I had, you know, I do try to keep some boundaries, believe it or not, from how I'm up here. I mean, somebody <laughs> said that they were worried about, you know, my confidence. I said, what could you possibly tell somebody that I haven't already told them? <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I wanted a boundary, and my wife very proudly went and put this book in our waiting room. And I said, no, no, I'm a pediatrician. I'm a writer. These two worlds don't come. And I was really quite upset. Uh, that she had crossed this, and my first patient came in, and she said, Dr. Vonnegut, I didn't know you had mental illness. And I said, yeah. And she says, well, I'm worried about Travis. And that was the whole problem of disclosure. It, it went by in a second, and that's the only bad thing that happens. These people are busy. People who are sick, they don't have time to worry about whether or not you're on psych meds or have a DSM diagnosis or have mental illness. They want to know what you can do for Travis. Now, Travis is a whole other story. But, <laughs> and for me, it is life-saving that I can go to work and worry about Travis and kids with 104 fevers and, and kids who don't do so well in school. This is, God bless, uh, you know, the fact that I have a job. Yeah, you know? well, well, indeed. Go ahead. I, I, I had just, people haven't talked about cost. And I've actually, um, uh, I, I, I know how to do PowerPoint a little bit, and I wanted to run through just a little bit, because the real problem uh, for the commissioners of mental health and everything else is how much they have to pay for medicines. And I wanted to, is this going to work? 
They promised me this would work. Uh oh. Something's happening. Anyway, okay. Here's the thing. It costs two hundred dollars to see me to see if you have an ear infection or not. When I started practicing pediatrics, I did it for ten dollars and did it happily and did a, and 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 uh, made a living at it. This is Louis Ferdinand Celine. Uh, traumatic train uh, industry was actually, yeah, he was shot in the head and uh, couldn't sleep, so he became a writer. He was also a family physician, and what he said to people, see, they lied to me. People don't deserve the restraint we show by not going into delirium in front of them. <laughs> um, you know, this was back when physicians had some courage. <laughs> um, and I don't, I'm, I'm really not happy that this thing doesn't uh, click over here. Anyway, um, okay, now I'm back to William Carlos Williams who said, if they give you lined paper, write the other way. He's a pediatrician and you have to, what a physician can do if nothing else is cut to the chase. And the idea that you are going to get good care by giving us best care guidelines and templates to fill out and being rude to ask people who are desperately unhappy about whether or not they have smoke detector detectors or have turned their car seats around is just plain rude. Um, this isn't, okay, yeah, they give you line paper. Okay, we as pediatricians were told that they were gonna double the amount of money they would give us for any given office visit or procedure. And where did we think those dollars were going to come from? Were we greedy? Were we asleep at the switch? Were we jealous? Uh, we were all of the above. And we also didn't have a choice because they, taught, they said, look, we're going to make it look to other people, if they accept insurance, that the care is going to be free. And if they keep coming to you, they're going to have to pay $10 and they're not going to do it. And they were right. So we had to become covered by insurers. Uh, dinosaur tales. 28-day programs for drugs and alcohol were available. Doctors returned phone calls. I would call up. I would tell somebody. I would tell the head of psychiatry at Mass General that I had a 14-year-old heroin addict, and people cared, and that patient got into treatment, and things happened. Now, it doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> practice overhead was 27%. Now, the suits will come in and tell you, yeah, that's fine, doctor, but uh, if you double what you're getting for every procedure and you double your overhead, you're making more money. And we bought that. We th but where did we think the money was going to come from? Um, er, you know, back then it was 10, 15, and 20 dollars. Everybody paid cash. There were no, uh, you know, and, and if they didn't, if people weren't happy, you know what I told, told them because they, my overhead was 27 percent? I said, fine, don't pay me. <laughs> I can't do that anymore. It's illegal for me not to accept a copayment. Now, if you address the concerns of a patient, and uh, you won't have time for all the boilerplate if you actually deal with somebody's problems. In the 1960s, the average family spent was $160 on medical care. Now it's $16,000 uh, just for insurance costs. And um, it goes on and on and on. And all of these things, electronic prescribing, all of these things are answers to questions we never really had. And all of these answers to our problems and co-payments and stuff is why it now costs $200 to f for somebody to find out whether or not they have an ear infection. The only thing good about me in the $200 is it costs them $2,000 if you go to South Shore Hospital. Um, now, metrics. I love science, but there should be a metric which evaluates whether or not these damn metrics are doing any good. Electronic prescribing creates a metric that can tell uh, beat down providers because that if I'm not using it over 50% of the time, it's going to cost me 25%, 25 cents per member per da 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 at Tufts and 15% at Harvard and at the Blue Cross. Now the data is created, is owned and operated by the insurers and the pharmaceutical industry. I can't even get the data. Um, and, this, and the other thing about, about electronic prescribing as the guy who actually does it and takes care of kids, it fails. 50% of the time if it's after 5 p.m. or if it's on the weekend. And so I have to call, the patient has to call, it goes on and on. Uh, co-payments don't necessarily, I mean, they, the, the, the co-payments don't do what they were advertised to do. This is just the, the, the skin in the game, you know, patients don't make, 
Anyway, I'm click through this. Uh, you know, here's the thing about asthma. We can't even do asthma. In asthma, we actually have effective treatments. And so the first uh, quality um, proven initiatives and asthma plans and stuff are all about asthma. Um, but the first thing that happens is you, you create a bounty on asthma because you can get a 99214 instead of a 99213 if you hear a wheeze when the kid is there. And then you get a complexity of diagnosis and you can charge a little bit more. Um, but but the real thing this does is the real asthmatics, I don't want them in my practice because they actually have time, I have to actually talk to them sometimes. So I want to either send them to the hospital or have them go somewhere else. Happily, they're all sort of color coded because they're in mass health because illness makes for poverty and poverty makes for illness. So I can just weed out and a lot of practices will just say, I'm not seeing mass health because it takes too damn much time. And that's where we put all the real asthmatics. So the QI and asthma has done zero except waste an awful lot of money. And if we can't do any good for asthma, what are we going to do about obesity or depression? Um, <laughs> and they do divide and conquer. They come and they say, because you went to Harvard and have an MGH residency, and by the way, anybody with decent self-esteem wouldn't bother to have uh, you know, credentials like mine. Um, <laughs> Blue Cross was giving us 20% more than other doctors. And now they come back five years later and say, we're going to cut all our payments to you by 20% because we haven't been able to prove that you're actually better at. It's, it's, such a, it's, it's a complete shell game. And, and, you know, and this idea that we are going to um, uh, pay for quality of medicine rather than quantity of medicine, they created the whole quantity quality game anyway. And if we could pay for antipsychotic medicines, what they cost in Canada and Europe and Mexico, we could balance all the mental health bu budgets in, you know, in this country. And so why aren't we serious about that? I mean, and, and if you could hospitalize people for four months for $11,000, like we used to be able to do, you wouldn't be such a crisis to eliminate all these beds. And also, um, the other thing that happens with this payer thing is um, you shouldn't let the payers keep the money they save by not caring for sick people. Yes. It goes on. But anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled. And, and you know, I start the meeting for the provider meetings at my practice now with, uh, have I told everybody I've been invited to give grand rounds at Johns Hopkins, which is true. So, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, you know, all this, um, uh, you know, I would have had to make it up. You know, the, one of the things about, um, about being, about the future is it happen, hasn't happened yet. It's like I'm telling my kid, patients all the time, you don't know what would happen if you started running a couple miles a day and stopped eating all your meals at McDonald's and actually cleaned up your room and stopped swearing at your mother and stopped smoking the, the marijuana. You don't know. The future hasn't happened yet. And I can get them interested in that. And, but if you had told, uh, if I, as a disheveled person, had told you in the day room that I was going to go to Harvard Medical School, do my residency at Mass General, and be invited to do grand rounds at Hopkins, uh, you would have up my meds. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice we're done. We have, a, we have time for a couple questions, and we have a couple runners. Real quick, we have about uh, five minutes. Hold up your hand, and somebody will be there with a mic, and we will try to see you. There's one right there in the front. Go ahead. Yeah, what happened to treating mental illness with vitamins? Isn't that what happened with you in British Columbia? With vitamins. Um, it, didn't, it didn't work. I mean, I, I really think it was, it, for me, it was a great prop, though, because I had to swallow 12 and 20 pills a day, uh, and it reinforced the idea that there was a medical thing wrong with me. I, I mean, I still take lots of vitamins. I am a great placebo responder. Um, <laughs> if you give me happy dust, I get happy. I'm very lucky that way, you know. And, um, uh, you, know, so it, it, you know, I wish it had worked. But, I, but I, I, I do think there are lots of nutritional deficiencies that come from not eating or sleeping for a couple of weeks. And so I think they may have gotten a little bounce that way. But um, statistically, it, it, just, it, it wasn't a good treatment for uh, psychotic people. Well, we have one. Who has a microphone? Go ahead. Since you have a, a history of mental illness and you're a doctor seeing children, 
Are there times when you can tell a kid is going to grow up and in 15 years or 20 years develop a mental illness? Do you get that sense? I think I see that in everybody. I really do. I really do. Um, and, and, and when you don't have a safety net, and, um, and one of the awful things that happens now in a bad economy is somebody says, well, I'm here to see you for my ADHD, uh, you know, my, my, my son's ADHD, but my husband just died. And I know that that's a risk factor because that family is going to be more stressed financially and everything else. And I think every family like mine that has generations of mental illness also has generations of people that know that they can go out and get a black leather jacket and they can tell their sons to go along with the voices. And I've showed it on airplanes and I've told relatives, um, you're upsetting people, you have to get up off the floor. And she says, well, I'm lying here so the black Jesus can talk to the white Jesus. And I said, I promise you, they're all hooked up now. You can get up off the floor, you have to take this pill, and that person will take it from me. And we know how to deal because, because you know, we have a family history of surviving this mental illness as well as having it. And I think there is nobody in this room, uh, I think my father was an upper class twit of a kid who went to war and was, you know, and dealing with that stress made him a man. Uh, I think you know, he, he refers to Franklin Delano Roosevelt would have been just another rich horse's ass if it hadn't been for polio. I think there, uh, there is something from surviving these illnesses which gives us an awful lot of strength. Right here. Uh, Dr. Fonica, I find you to be very informative and funny, or maybe I should say humorous, because funny has other meanings. And I, I want to ask about the extent to which you have personally used or advocate the use of humor uh, in recovery. I think humor and art and everything, you know, it, it's a way of making human contact. Um, and I, I, you know, I think I recently I had, uh, it, it, you know, I had this kid who came up and said, you know, he said, I know I have to stop drinking, but I hate the steps. And I said, good. And his mother said, you can't, the steps are going to save his life. I said, no, I want him to hate the steps. He needs to take them seriously. Uh, you, you have to be in the moment. And humor and actually seeing through the convention of niceties and stuff uh, is life-saving. It's, you know, it's just like the arts aren't just this extra thing you do to you know, impress girls if you're not on the football team. It's actually, you know, it actually helps you be in the moment, which is how you actually survive these illnesses. Do you take any kind of maintenance drug to, I, I'm, I have a cousin who suffers from schizophrenia and he goes, he gets off his meds, and goes back into right. a very cyclical problem. And I'm just curious if you do something that helps you maintain. Yes. Um, and I think if psychiatric medicine makes you better, you'd be crazy not to take it. Um, <laughs> I... Tuttleable. <laughs> I, um, uh, you know, I recently had to be weaned off of lithium, my beloved lithium. I, as my psychiatrist said, you had a good run. Yeah, I had a 20 some odd year run, uh, but it started eating up the nerves and, and this and, um, and I was terrified. But I, I, you know, I would love someday to look in a mirror and see somebody who didn't need psychiatric medication, but you know. I, I think the time, the clock is sort of running out, and I think it's probably not going to happen, you know. And I think I've noticed I'm taking a new medicine, and I'm a little more reactive than I was on the lithium, but, um, you know, that's okay, you know. <laughs> I, I know, I mean, there are things, I, you know, I catch myself, like I was on, at 4 a.m., on my way here, uh, my wife was, Pat, you know, getting me ready for the cab, and she told me I had to bring receipts, and I started being really pissed off and saying that Mitt Romney didn't have to keep receipts. And, <laughs> and she said, and, and I said, but you know, with less medication, I would have gone on about that for days, you know, but I, <laughs> the meds I'm currently on allowed me to keep that down to about 15 minutes and then, be, and, and then laughing at it. And I made some crack about how he looks like a groom on a wedding cake, and I'm I, done with it. And, hey, and <laughs> even, even those of us without medication go on at least 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. uh, one more question. I think we have time. 
Dr. Vonnegut, you um, are a writer and an artist in addition to being a pediatrician, and your father was a writer, and you've talked about multiple generations of your family having an artistic leaning. And we know that there's a connection between uh, bipolar disorder and creativity. So I'm wondering if when you are um, feeling well and stable, if you feel like that that takes an edge off your creativity and or if you've observed that in your family? No, it's having the outlet. And I think all good art is made in defiance of the illness and not by giving into it. Um, and I all the time hear people say, oh, I feel, so much, you know, I feel so much more creative if I stop taking my meds. Well, there aren't a lot of great paintings and novels written by people who check their meds. And I think if you look at the history of Vincent van Gogh and when he painted, he was desperately trying to maintain his islands of sanity where he could be in contact with the world, and he did it by painting. He didn't go, woof! Uh, and, uh, and he fought, and, and all artists, including my father when he was writing, were fighting to keep their contact with humanity by trying to tell the truth to save their own lives. And that's what I've finally come to realize art is. All right. Well, we thank you for sharing your art and your wisdom with us. Thank you so much. What do we do now? Get up, take a bow. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was absolutely uh, delightful. Um, I was reminded in my own life experience of um, my mother um, dying of cancer. And I've often said to people that uh, cancer, in the end, ended up being her greatest gift because it really forced her to come to grips with her life and her regrets and, and um, be at peace with herself. And so that uh, when she died, um, she was more beautiful than she ever had been when she had been well, quote unquote. Um, so that I think there's a real power that can come from um, the, the challenges. You know, I like that old Confucians um, saying about it takes much friction to make gem. And Dr. Vonnegut, you are truly a gem. And Rich Fisher, thank you so much you. for a wonderful interview. Uh, one short announcement, Dr. Vonnegut's books, as I mentioned earlier, uh, The Eden Express and Just Like Someone Without Mental Illness, Only More So, are available for sale, and Dr. Vonnegut will be signing them in the foyer outside of the ballroom. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon.